Shopify Masters is powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. To get an extended 30-day trial, visit shopify.com slash masters. If you don't do something different or if you just offer the same thing that people can find elsewhere, they're going to go elsewhere. Hey, my name is Felix. I'm the host of Shopify Masters. Each week, we learn the keys to success from e-commerce experts and entrepreneurs like you. In this episode, you'll learn the downsides of launching a smaller product before your flagship product, how to determine which differentiators matter to your target customers, and product photography tips for beginner photographers. Today, I'm joined by Corey Stevens from Taft. Taft specializes in men's shoes, handmade in Spain, and men's fashion accessories. It was starting in 2015 and based out of Provo, Utah. Welcome, Corey. Hey, Felix. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So, yeah, tell us a bit more about your your store and the popular products that you sell. So, we launched our shoe line about 14 months ago, and and it's been you know we've really hit our stride since then. The you know we started a couple years ago, and the first year was basically building our audience and and kind of product testing and and getting a litmus test for the market. And then 14 months ago, we launched shoes. And since then, you know, our boots have been really popular. Um, we've continued to roll out some some smaller accessories like belts and shoe trees and just supplemental um, products like that. But yeah, man, it's been it's been a dream. Shopify has been obviously ex- extremely instrumental in the success we've had so far. And uh, yeah, man, I'm happy to share what I've learned and, and hopefully be able to help, you know, in small ways to others. Mm-hmm. And what, what specifically about shoes or men's fashion? Why, why did you choose this industry? It, it really was, I saw an opportunity. Um, I, my background, I, I started Taft right out of college. My background was in linguistics, so nothing to do with shoes or men's fashion. Um, but I just saw an opportunity and, and a niche that wasn't being filled very well. And so rather than me being, you know, like a lifelong shoemaker or anything like that, it was more about seeing the opportunity and preparing myself to be able to, to successfully, you know, go into that niche and, and make some noise. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess in your words, what was that niche that you felt was underserved? I mean, direct consumer footwear, there, there, there are certainly other brands doing it, but you know, you look at, you look at, um, how obviously Warby Parker, one of the first, but then you look at Casper, um, Lisa purple, you know, Blue Apron, all these companies doing really creative things um, with direct consumer and products that you wouldn't necessarily think would lend itself to the direct consumer model. So, so at this this specific price point, plus being direct consumer, and then really unique shoes. I don't design, I don't design. You know, your plain, boring office shoes. I design the shoes that you wear out with your friends and. Typically, these types of shoes are extremely expensive. They'd be considered designer shoes, and so we've we've created luxury designer shoes that are super unique that can't be found anywhere else, and still offered at you know between two and three hundred dollars because we only sell direct consumer. We do not wholesale at all, and so so I saw that niche and I saw that you know if I wanted something like I had in my head, I couldn't find it anywhere, or the only you know some designers, I could see it on the red carpet, but that's about it. It wasn't accessible for the normal layman. So, so I saw the opportunity and I just jumped right in, man. It was, it was a a big risk and a, and a big leap of faith for me, pretty uncomfortable at times, but, but I'm so glad I've done it and I've learned, you know, so much. Yeah. You know, for most people, when they see uh, an industry model, a business model, and then they recognize that this doesn't exist in the industry that I'm interested in, it's a pretty daunting task to think about how do I unravel all, all of this and essentially uh, take a business model from that industry and apply it, like you're saying, Casper, the mattress industry, and now apply it to to you know high-end shoes. What was the what were the first steps? Like, how did you even begin to understand how can I build out a a supply chain? How do I build a business around this model that didn't really exist before? And you're totally right. Yeah, because the industry has been prepped and and operated in such a way for hundreds of years, basically. Which is, you know, specifically in the shoe industry, it's all about wholesale. It's these huge brand groups 
that just keep pumping different brands through their same distribution channels over and over. And so even, even the relationship with our factory, I've really, it's been really uncomfortable for them and very, very different. You know, these quick turnaround times, these unique shoes, unique textiles, it's very uncomfortable for them too. And so I've had to do a lot of, um, you know, a lot of grooming and helping them to see my vision. And now they're, you know, now they're starting to see it and we're, you know, we're their biggest client at this point. But, but early on, every, everyone did not, no one understood what I was looking for and how I was looking to do it. And, and also it goes back to the consumer, the end consumer as well, because, um, direct consumer, it requires a lot of education and trust because guys, you know, guys our age don't really want to buy shoes online. Many men need to try it on in person, see it, feel it, smell it. You know? And so it, it requires a lot of education, um, a lot of intent behind captions and emails and, and everything I can to help them understand why we do it this way and how we're so different. And then it requires a lot of trust because, you know, people don't want to buy shoes. You know, there's many products that people don't want to buy online. And shoes is probably one of them for many people. And so, it, you know, we have to do a good job of presenting ourselves. Anything public facing has to be really good because, you know, we have to gain their trust and confidence for them to throw down, you know, a few hundred dollars on a brand they've never heard of and a product they've never seen in person, you know. Mm. And kind of a two part question. Uh, how did you learn the steps that you needed to take to get to this goal, not just for the to, to reach the consumer to educate them, but then it sounds like a big part of it, especially early on, was educating the vendors, the people that are or you know above you, I guess, in the supply chain. Like what did you have to I guess teach them and how did you how did you go about that? I mean, a lot of it is pretty simple because it's kind of just my passion for how I want to do it. You know, I, I spend, I go to our factory in Spain very often and I spend, you know, at least an hour or two on the phone with them every day. And so it's a lot of, just a lot of teaching and telling them and, and also like the feedback that I give them, you know, the feedback and the, the critiques that we, you know, this constant process of critiquing and improving, they can see where my priorities are by the feedback that I'm giving to them. And, and so really early on, I spent, you know, I spent a lot of time away from my family at the factory. Um, I have two little children and my wife. And, and so I, I had to go to Spain quite often to help them understand that, look, guys, this isn't going to work unless we have extremely efficient supply chain and really quick turnarounds. And so that meant, you know, doing things really differently for Taft that they did for their other clients you know, ordering certain materials earlier than expected, ordering in higher quantities, um, just improving the in-factory supply chain as well. There's a lot of ways that, that the factory wasn't working super efficiently. And so basically going into the factory and doing like a production audit and telling them how when you're producing for Taft, it needs to be different in X, Y, and Z ways. And, and at the beginning, they really didn't want to do it. Everyone fought back, you know, and they... Mm -hmm down to like my designs, my shoe designs. They didn't like them. Um, they were very different. They didn't like the textiles I was using. They didn't like the leathers I was choosing and the colors. You know, it's, it's very non-traditional for them when they're used to just kind of, you know, European um, plain brown and black shoes. But now, you know, with, with all of this work, we're starting to see the, the super lean supply chain and the extreme efficiency in production and shipping <clears throat> and uh, now our turnaround times are down by about 30%, and and we're really starting to crank out, you know, some great shoes in high volumes and pretty quickly. Mm. Now, how, because you were a small player at, at a certain point in the early days, how did you make the, how did you kind of dictate these things to much larger manufacturers that I'm assuming were m much more used to to working with the much larger brands, uh, how were you able to, I guess, enforce these things that you wanted to, to do? I think a lot of it was honestly going to the factory and spending a lot of time with them. I speak Spanish, which, which helps a lot to develop that initial trust and confidence. And, um, you know, you're right though. It's, it, it's, it was pretty crazy that they even accepted us on as a new client. They have to turn down pretty much everyone, you know, fast shoe factories, it seems like everyone wants to start a shoe company. And so when you do that, you know, you get all these people trying to sample, 
but but you know maybe maybe five percent of them make it past the sampling stage, and so they're turning they're turning away everyone. Um, but I think that our large social media presence, you know, made them think, oh man, maybe you know maybe they can do a lot of volume like they say. And then um, you know I went there right off right off the bat. I went there and spent a week with them every day in the factory with the with the factory, the workers, the craftsmen, to the owners and management um, and the office staff. I was there, you know, all day, every day, despite my extreme jet lag at the time. Um, I was there with them. I was eating meals with them, and I was I was really starting to become friends with them. And now that relationship is what it's all about for us, um, because early on, honestly, it was really lucky, um, and we were extremely, um, we're really blessed that we were able to work with them because they're one of the best factories in Europe. You know, they've made for Christian Louboutin, Yves Saint Laurent. Um, Prada, Gucci, you know, they make like these luxury, luxury, huge brand shoes. And now they love the way we work. They love the way Taft operates and they, they've become favorable to our style of business, which is awesome. But, um, I would say, you know, looking really, you know, brand, that brand legitimacy online and on social media helped a lot because I'm sure that they looked at our, you know, our Instagram account and saw, Whoa, this is a lot of people um, that want these people's shoes. So let's make for them. And then obviously spending a week with them was, was instrumental in, in, in getting them to agree to work with us and sample. And so you, you already had an audience built up by the time you approached these manufacturers. Is that what you think helped a lot to, to get them to, to trust in you early on? Yeah. I mean, so, so giving you a little bit of background on the brand. So we launched a Kickstarter campaign for our no show socks about three years ago. And we did our no-show socks, but the intent was never to just be no-show socks. It was to launch no-show socks, a product that I knew we could improve on and, and make some noise. And it, it gave us, it bought us some time to basically market test our audience and figure out what they wanted. And so for a year, I was, I was taking and spending a lot of time taking great pictures and building up this audience online and testing in front of them what would perform well. And so then that gave me an idea of what kind of products they would want to see. Um, so yeah, by the time, by the time it was, I was ready to sample with the factory and really started sampling. I bet we had probably 150,000 Instagram followers and, and a good, a good rapport and a good repertoire of products and, and, you know, a good reputation, um, for quality products and a cool brand that was up and coming. And then we launched shoes to, to an audience so that we could be springboarded into success rather than kind of fall flat if no one cared, you know, launching a new product is much easier. Obviously, if you have, you know, if you have a lot of people looking at you. Mm. Now, when you did start working with these manufacturers, because you wanted to do things so differently than what they were used to, uh, what, what you can, I guess a lot of people might expect is that the manufacturers eventually would kind of settle back into, I guess, a default state. Now, tactically, how do you make sure that they keep to your standards, keep to your processes, especially if you're not you know, there on the floor all the time, making sure that everything is going to, I guess, the original, uh, I guess, this is a process design that, that you created. Yeah, you're so right. That's, that's exactly what happens. Um, you know, they've been doing something a certain way for years and years and years. And then for a certain brand that they produce for, you know, I want it very different. And so I go there, um, about four or five times a year and I, I WhatsApp, you know, I have WeChat and WhatsApp and I'm constantly every day giving the factory owner feedback, you know, I'll take a picture of a shoe and I'll send it to him and say, Hey, we can't have this, you know? So there's that constant communication, literally 24 seven. And we have a text go ongoing, uh, full of pictures and video and feedback. And then I also hired someone to be there, um, to basically, um, be on the floor almost full time. Um, so that I can make sure that every shoe that goes into a shoe box is up to my standards. And we have, you know, certain, certain standards and requirements. And he makes sure that those are met on every pair. And when they're not, um, then, then I have that communication with directly to the factory owner, um, to, to make sure that, to make sure that it is up to my standards. And you're exactly right. It is this constant battle of them falling back into their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And so that's why communication open and frequent communication is really important. 
because if not, they'll just fall back into their, you know, the way they've been doing it forever. Mm, that's that's a great point. That stay in constant communication and and this kind of feedback that you're providing on a constant basis, rather than just you know waiting, uh, just to to go there every every you know a few times a year. I think it's important to to stay in contact uh, through other means. Uh, now, are there demands or standards that are now available to you that weren't available to you earlier on? Now that you have this working relationship and and kind of track record of uh, success in the partnership with the uh, manufacturers? Yeah. So the first thing, the very obvious thing would be payment terms. Um, you know, initially we talked about payment terms and, and they were very, very against it. They've been burned too many times by small American companies. And so payment terms now, you know, we have, we have negotiated on a little flexibility there, which is super helpful. It allows me to produce more than I would be able to also, um, our turnaround time is really quick. You know, now they give me priority on sampling. Um, they give me priority on production time, you know, everything, you know, now that I've become their biggest client, they've, they've really done what, whatever they can to help me. Obviously, um, direct communication with the factory owner is huge. You know, he and I are texting back and forth all day long, which is very rare and unique for our situation. Um, so, you know, it's these, some of these opportunities have really popped up and, and, and then another one is, um, better pricing. Um, you know, we've negotiated certain tiered pricing that, you know, this year, if I hit X number of pairs, then they're going to give me a X percentage discount, which is again, a huge motivator for me. Um, so it's, it's beneficial for both, both parties. And, um, you know, you're right. Uh, you know, talking about it and having this question is cool because it helps me realize like, man, yeah, we do get a lot of preference with the factory, and we've got we've gained that preference very quickly, and it's a huge you know it's a huge blessing for us because it's it's really important for our style of business. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Now you were saying earlier about how shoes is obviously the main focus today. When you go onto your site, it's the prominently displayed product. But you didn't always start there. You first started with these no-show socks so with a Kickstarter campaign. I'm looking at it here, the Wimbley's the true no-show sock. Now, did you, you, did you always have this goal from the beginning to first launch with socks just to build this audience, well, not just to, but as a way to build an audience that then you could launch shoes to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's, that's reflected in even our, our, our URL on our website, tappedclothing.com. It kind of gives you an idea of where my head was at initially and where, you know, where I see the brand going long-term. Um, but yeah, we launched, I launched no show socks because at the time there wasn't really anyone else doing men's no show socks very well. Now you have, you know, lots of brands doing it, but back then, no, you know, if I wanted no show socks, I was either borrowing, you know, growing up, I was borrowing my mom's like really feminine ones Mm -hmm. or, or plain white ones. And so my, my thought process was, well, let me do men's no-show socks with great, cool, masculine patterns that actually stay up on your, on your heel. Um, but running a brand just on, on such a niche product like that, a polarizing niche product like men's no-show socks is, um, would be really difficult. And so the intent was to utilize it as a test product, basically, to build an audience, gain some traction, and then do something that, that I had more confidence in. Um, you know, our, our no show socks, it was really successful and there's thousands of people that really, really love them. But, um, from a, from a, a big, big picture perspective, it would be really hard for me to just run a brand on no show socks. And I knew that shoes, you know, our audience loved shoes and I knew that I could design unique shoes that they couldn't find anywhere else that would only further encourage their, you know, purchasing and their loyalty and their, you know, their brand cult vibes, you know? Um, so yeah, that was the, mm-hmm. that was the intent from the beginning. And, and now we're starting to kind of blossom into what I've wanted to be for the last couple of years. Yeah. That's a, certainly a very patient game plan that I feel like, uh, I haven't seen too many entrepreneurs take. And obviously the, the big benefit for you was that you now have a huge audience and customer base to, like you were saying earlier, test products against it. Then of course launch to, and then all these other boons like manufacturers being more willing to work with you because of that following. What about the, the downsides? Were there any downsides to taking this approach? 
approach of first launching with a, a smaller, more feasible product and before launching your, your ultimate goal product? Yeah, I mean, part of me would say that, that the fact that it was men's no-show socks is kind of a downside just because it's so polarizing. So someone that found us early on, you know, either you love and need men's no-show socks or you think they're really lame. You know, there's kind of not a middle ground of like, you know, a lot of people would say, why in the world do I need striped no-show socks if they're, you know, if they're supposed to be invisible, who cares what they look like? Give me plain black ones, you know? And so I think that because it was such a polarizing product, people per- pretty early on probably, you know, passed on us, mm-hmm. which is totally fine. And then the second thing would be, you know, if early on, if someone had a bad experience with our socks, they would kind of check out. You know, it's, it's, it wasn't a safe product necessarily to, to kind of test. Um, so if, if someone really had a bad experience with our no-show socks, they're probably not going to come back, unfortunately. Um, but that would be the same for any product. You know, if you have a bad experience early on with a brand, chances are you're not going to be c- coming back to them to purchase again, despite a new product like shoes. Um, but, you know, even though, you know, it was, it, w- it wasn't safe, but that's probably why we had success is because we were, you know, we, we had a soapbox, we had a platform and we stuck to our guns and we really, you know, we're about something. We were really carving out a brand identity rather than just playing it safe and just being a general men's fashion Instagram account or something like that. You know, we were really trying to do something and I think people could see that intent and, and could see the potential and got behind it pretty early. Mm -hmm. If someone wanted to take this same approach as you, where they start with an entry product before launching their flagship product, what kind of questions do you think they should ask themselves to figure out what should that entry product be that could, you know, tie into their, ultimately their flagship product? Yeah, I think it would need to be products in the same kind of industry for sure. You know, definitely a product that makes sense. Something like socks and shoes, obviously, you know, go hand in hand. Um, so, but I would, I would, my, the most important thing would be, can you do it differently or can you improve on what's already being done for shoes? If we launch shoes to an audience of zero, I don't think our shoes would have the, you know, the reputation and the following that they do, but because we were able to launch shoes to a large audience, people were really able to get behind it early, which, which really propelled, you know, got us a lot of momentum. And so I think if someone's considering taking a similar approach that I did, they need to make sure that they can do it differently. You know, really go into a product that you can market and advertise and and build a brand behind it differently than what's already being done. Men's No Show Socks, I saw an opportunity and I jumped on it and I was bold in my execution. So when, if someone is considering this, make sure you, you have to do something different. If If you don't do something different or if you just offer the same thing that people can find elsewhere, they're going to go elsewhere. You know, if people could have found, you know, if I was making plain brown wingtips, you know, like, like you can find in every men's shoe store, people would go elsewhere because they don't want to buy shoes online and they want to, they want to buy it from a brand they've heard of. There's a lot of obstacles to people buying shoes from Taft. They can't try them on. They've never heard of them and they don't know how good they are. Um, and so if they, if there's substitutes or replacement products that people can get elsewhere, they're going to get them elsewhere. They're going to go with what's comfortable. And so someone that's considering a new product, make sure it's really different and, and cling to those differences rather than trying to, you know, assimilate to being the same. You have to be different or you're just going to get lost in the mix. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think the follow-up question to, to that is that if you do, of course, take this advice and go really different, identify your differentiators and cling to it. The question is, I think, you know, how do you know which differentiators are actually going to matter to, to the customer, uh, customers at the end of the day? How did you figure out what's going to, to matter to, to your customers? What kind of differentiators will matter to them? You know what? Early on, I asked a lot of my friends. I remember, <laughs> I remember I sent out, you know, I, I had I just graduated college, so I had a good you know, group of friends, group of guy friends that would be my target audience. So I I emailed out, um, basically some horrible Microsoft paint sketches of my socks. (laughs) They were, um, but I got their feedback, you know, like if you guys were buying no show socks, 
what are the pain points? You know, they're, they're too feminine or they don't stay up. Um, so it, as long as those differences are, are solving problems, then, then they're going to be accepted differences. You know, you don't mm-hmm. just appear to be weird. That works for some brands that works for, um, you know, it works for lots of brands, but, but don't, don't just be weird and different to be weird and different, but be, be different to solve problems and pain points. Um, because that's what people will, will be drawn to the differences that make a difference in their lives. You know, that's what, that's, what's important. Yeah, what are your thoughts on, on when you find a differentiator, but you see one brand doing, brand A doing, and then you find another differentiator you want to go with and you see brand B doing it, combining those two things together, is that, do you think that's enough or do you need to come up with something that you've never seen before in any brand? I think, I think the way you execute differently is really important as well. So not only the product being different, you know, combining two differences is great and that will, that will work, but that alone won't work. It's how you take those differences and and execute on them in your marketing and your branding and your social media presence. You know what I mean? It's like just any product can be different. You can go on Alibaba and find, you know, millions of different products, kind of weird products. They exist and they're already made, but, but it's about, you know, taking those differences and, and really owning them and then, and then executing and expressing those differences and, and showing how they're meaningful to your audience. Can we talk a little bit about this, like tactically on a day to day basis? How do you, how does the company express and and make sure that these differences are very clear to your your audience? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's that's the question I ask myself too. Because initially, I thought, oh man, people are going to buy our shoes because they're going to love the business model. You know, we're doing it differently. We're saving them hundreds of dollars on this type of quality shoe. But then I kind of realized that people were buying our shoes because they liked the designs and they couldn't find them anywhere else. But that direct consumer business model is a really important thing to me. And I think that's what's going to really um, create, you know, more virality behind the brand. You know, people rather than just like, man, look at this cool pair of shoes I bought. Aren't they so cool? They're, they look awesome. I want that. Met, I want that conversation to go more like this. Look at this awesome pair of shoes I bought. They only sell direct to consumer. So that I, you know, if this shoe were in Nordstrom, it would cost me 500 bucks. You know, I want that to be a part of the conversation. And so I'm, I'm constantly dealing with this. How can I educate our consumers? You know, people are initially drawn to our product because of the way it looks. It's a very physical, visible product. But every day I'm dealing with this. How can I teach them that about direct consumer business model and why our shoes are such a good bang for your buck? And so, you know, in terms of execution, that means my Instagram captions are really thought out and informative. Um, I utilize infographics on the website and on social media. I'm sending out, um, you know, our, our welcome to our email subscriber, our, our automatically triggered email right when someone signs up is about that. Um, I'm redoing our about us page right now to really reflect this. I'm, I'm working on a new, a new social media series where, where, um, you know, it's focused on educating our consumers because we have lots of, lots of our followers and our audience isn't intending to buy a pair of shoes from us right now, but it's through this education that we do convert them into buyers. You know, a lot of people find our shoes and love the way they look and that's awesome, but that's only half of the story with Taft. The other half is our business model. And so, you know, trying to constantly drive that home with our audience is, is a struggle, but, but, but I'm trying to do the best I can. And I'm constantly going back to that. And how can I change the website and our social media profiles and all of our email contact to reflect our business model and our unique shoes? Hmm, that's, that's a, I guess a, a very interesting approach because these, these, uh, customers or these, uh, audience members are entering your, your brand's universe through their, their, I guess uh, one type of messaging, which is that they love the design, but then you, once the, once they come in, you want them to leave with a different type of messaging or at least an, an additional type of messaging, which is about 
the direct to consumer. How, how's that? Is that I'm, I'm assuming that's kind of probably going to be a big challenge, right? Or it has been a big challenge for you, just because it's it's kind of hard, right, to to change the way people think about a, a product, a brand. Which of these avenues have been the most successful for you? You mentioned Instagram infographics, uh, updates onto your site, email marketing. Which ones do you think has been the most impactful for you in terms of I guess reeducating people on on how you want them to think about your brand? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question because people obviously are seeing images, so they like the way it looks. People don't want to read captions. You know, I'm always amazed at how few people actually read a caption, and so people are are joining the Taft family because of an image or a video, not because of a caption or some text. You know, so they kind of enter the funnel with with only half the story, and so I would say that that having that initial triggered email be about this is really key because it really sets the tone and it gives them, you know, this is our first impression with them. And we're going to tell you about the value that you're getting because of our, our super lean business model. Um, but then also, you know, when just, just two nights ago, I posted a pretty lengthy caption about, about our business model on Instagram and it gained a lot of traction and it had, you know, I think it had like 30,000 views on the video and it had, you know, maybe 200 comments because every once in a while something will hit well and people will realize and it, it really does help educate them. Unfortunately, a lot of times it, it, they go unread as well. But I would say that initial first impression email has been key. And then I'm, you know, I'm working on the new About Us page, which is going to be used also as a landing page. So I'm going to be driving traffic specifically to that page because it's so important to me that I want people to know that and not only see our products. Mm. Now, when you were gearing up to launch the the shoes, what did you learn about during the process of launching the the socks that you knew that you had to take those lessons and apply it immediately or that they were so important that you had to apply them at some point when launching the, the shoes? Luckily, thankfully, I was able to get a lot of feedback based on data, you know, likes and comments on certain pictures. You know, I was going and buying shoes and taking a picture of them and returning them just to test how my audience would react to a certain style of shoe. So I was really testing and looking. I was actively looking for feedback, whether good or bad. Um, But some of the things I learned, I'd say one would be you know, I'm always constantly in this battle with myself of designing something that I like versus designing something that, that I think will do well. And and I have to remember that, of course, I'm I'm the designer and I it's nice when I love the product and would wear it myself. But it's also important to put the brand first and my audience first before my preferences personally, you know, Corey's preferences. Um, I'm really looking at what what they want rather than what I like necessarily. So it's, it's putting the brand before me a lot of times. Um, and the, another really, really important lesson that I learned is to never rush to launch a product. Um, I, I have released a couple products sooner than I should have. And, and unless they're really, really ready and your supply chain and your production is, is really ready and fine tuned to launch a product, do not launch it until it's ready because, um, you know, you only get one shot and you never know if, if, if that customer is only going to come once, you want to make sure that they leave with a great taste in their mouth. And, and so, you know, don't rush to market a product unless it's really ready because I've, Mm. I've, I've done that and it doesn't end up well. So make sure that your product is really ready before you put it out there. Um, because putting in that time before will save you a lot of headache after. Were these specific to your your product, your industry? What, what was the what were the issues that you were running into? Yeah, I mean, I mean, initially, um, I, I had sampled and designed and, and had our no show socks ready, and then last mm-hmm. minute had to change had to change factories, um, which obviously set us back a lot of time, and and so yeah, I kind of rushed it, and luckily it, it turned out okay. But later on, I've, I've tried to introduce new products. You know, I introduced some belts and I introduced shoe trees and I, I launched our shoe trees and, and we pre-sold a lot of them on pre-order and then I got them and they were not right. You know, one of the sizes did not fit our shoes. 
and they totally blew it. And, and it was, you know, it was embarrassing and, and it was a headache to manage, you know, hundreds of people emailing me saying, Hey, these don't even fit. You know, it's just a huge headache. And then with belts, you know, I'm, I, I'm still a team of one. I run the brand on my own still, um, which is why I can be so quiet in my office because there's no one else ever here. <laughs> um, but, but I, ru- I run the brand on my own and, and I get a lot of pressure to grow and expand. And so sometimes I've tried to answer those, those, those voices of expansion with new products. And so one of those was belts, you know, obviously a very complimentary product to, to shoes. Lots of men only buy a pair of shoes if there's a matching belt. And so I found a, a wonderful family that makes beautiful belts in Spain. But I didn't prepare our audience to know how to measure their waists properly. And so we, we launched a few styles on pre-order and, and then everyone got their belts and they were too small for them. Not everyone, you know, maybe, maybe 20% of them got their belts and they were too small, but that resulted in, you know, 75 people that, that we had to go through and return their orders and get the belts back. And it was a huge shipping issue, a huge, you know, tons of emails. And just the, the, the thing that hurts me most is what if this was their only experience with Taft, you know, either the shoe trees or the belts, obviously if they're a return customer, they know the quality and the, my standards, you know, they know me and they know what I want and how I operate and, and they know how much they can expect from Taft. But if it's someone that's just popping in and liked a belt and they ordered a belt, then they walked away with a bad experience with Taft and that, you know, that's obviously a massively missed opportunity. And so those are, those are a couple examples, you know, really, really true personal examples that are, that are big learning moments for me in 2000. 16 last year that I learned and, and, um, they were costly, but I've learned them and I won't make them again. Mm. Now, when you say not rushing to launch, is that, do you mean to say that you, you recommend people to do more testing? Is it to mean launching to smaller audiences or does it mean spending more time asking, I guess, specific questions? Yeah. Never sell a product unless it's really ready. <laughs> um, but yeah, but in, in order to do that, I think that you need to do a lot of testing. You know, now I utilize fit clinics with all of our new products because I need to minimize returns and exchanges. We offer free returns and free exchanges, um, which could be really costly if we had a high percentage of returns and exchanges. Um, and so I utilize fit clinics and I make sure that, you know, in addition to product pages on the site, you have to have the complimentary information regarding sizing and all of your policies and everything like that, it has to be really well done and really well thought out. And, and the customer has to have that information, you know, access to that information before, because if they don't, it, you know, it's just, it's the same way with any relationship. When expectations are clarified, the room for error is, you know, it's, it's much smaller than the chance that you're going to have issues. And so with your customers, you know, you, you need to obviously offer them the product but they also have to have the ability to make sure it's going to be a right fit for them, both, um, you know, physically fit them and, you know, be what they're looking for. And so I would recommend utilizing more testing, more feedback, utilize, you know, your personal Facebook audiences. You know, I'm always reaching out to, to my personal network saying, Hey guys, new product in the pipeline. What do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? You know, I'll go on my Facebook and I'll shoot out a, you know, a new post about, Hey guys, I'm working on this. Do you like this? Do you hate it? Um, how, you know, if, if, if you were a nine and a half in Nikes, what would you say you wear in Taft? You know, I'm always piggybacking off of whatever audience I can because just offering a product is, is great. But, but when you, when you lack that background information that the customer needs that they aren't getting because they're not in a store working with a salesperson, you have to make sure that they have that or it can create, you know, massive logistical headaches on the back end with your customer support and your shipping and your production, it can just cause a lot of headaches. And so more work up front will save you a lot of time on the back end. Mm. You mentioned fit clinics. What are, what are fit clinics? The fit clinic is where I say, you know, I have a new style that I'm going to launch and I say, okay, you know, I'll blast it out to our local network and and my personal network. And I say, Hey, Friday at 5 PM, we're going to have pizza. Um, there's going to be some music, some, you know, some drinks, come on into the office. We're, uh, we're going to measure your foot. We're going to test your, you know, try on all these shoes, see what fits you. We're going to record all this data and we're going to, you know, 
export out a new size guide. Um, and so just, just making sure, you know, obviously you can measure, you know, feet are so crazy, man. Like everyone's foot is so different. And, and so trying to generate this really robust size guide is tough, but via fit clinics, um, we're able to, you know, for example, um, last week, last Friday, we have a couple of new styles that we're launching and we brought, you know, 40 people into the office and we had some pizza for them and we had, you know, good times, but we were really there to gather data and have everyone try on shoes and say, okay, if you were an 11 and a half in Nikes or a 10 in Allen Edmonds, what would you wear in Taft? Let's measure your foot in centimeters. Let's measure it in inches. Let's measure it on a Brannock device um, to make sure that to to make sure that you know we our shoes are fitting and and the information we're we're sharing with the with our audience is is accurate. Um, and then also we utilize you know feedback. We do we've had a few events where we get you know I get all of our new samples in from the factory. And I invite everyone I can and we get, you know, hundreds of people through and they vote on which is their favorite. And it's, it's not a perfect sample size, but it's, it's something, you know, so that we can not only launch things that I like, but more importantly, launch things that, that most people will like the most from our, you know, from all of our samples for every shoe we release, we probably sample like three or four styles. And so, you know, getting, utilizing feedback, both with fit and with preferences, um, has been really valuable for us, especially when I don't have a lot of resources. You know, I run the brand on my own and I don't have a huge team to get this information for me. And so I utilize our existing audience and my personal network as much as I can to get, to get feedback. Mm. And when you're utilizing the, the existing audience in preparation to launch the, the shoes, you, you mentioned that you're product testing by just showing pictures of other shoes and shoes that you, you found that you bought. Talk to us a little more about this. How did you, I guess, talk to us about this, this, this process of testing using other products. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I would, I was going to Nordstrom, Nordstrom rack like twice a week probably and, and hitting up, you know, multiple Nordstrom racks. There's a few in my area. And so I'd go and buy, you know, buy a couple of unique pairs take pictures of them and then return them. Um, you know, nor they, they knew I was doing this. I told them what I was doing and they were totally cool with it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of gritty and, and, and non-traditional, but that's what I was doing. And it, it allowed me to get a wide range of shoes and figure out based on data, like, you know, likes and comments and shares and things like that, kind of get a, you know, finger to the wind test on what our audience liked. And it turned out that, you know, they really liked unique shoes, um, stuff that people would always ask, man, where did you find those shoes? You know, we used it to, to market our product. You know, we were, we were showing our socks with shoes. We weren't just showing no show socks with, you know, kind of ugly men's feet. No one wants to look at that and there's no reason why it would follow. But if we, if we put together really killer outfits and we put together cool outfit grids and, and showed really beautiful shoes with, with our socks, um, it was good for our socks. It was marketing our product, but it was also allowing me to figure out what did people like. And so when, when, when I put a certain product up and people would freak out over it, you know, I'd kind of make a mental note of, all right, man, like that's something that I could riff off of and, and people would really like it, you know? And now, now I, I, I haven't done that since we launched shoes. Like I, now I can trust myself and I trust my designs and I kind of, I know our audience well enough to know things that they'll like. But early on I was, you know, I was, I was shopping for shoes, um, at places with relaxed return um, policies so that I could, I could photograph them, build a social media audience, take the best, you know, the best shoe and men's fashion pictures I could. And, and, and meanwhile, you know, doing market research with my audience now you on the the Instagram, which is uh, at Taft T A F T, you now have three hundred twenty thousand followers on there. What's been the 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 key to to growing Instagram to this size? From the very beginning, I mean, like I said, we have a really you know the team is one person at this point. So um, for me, it's it's always been about taking the best pictures. Um, if you if you put in the effort to take great pictures, you will get the return on it. So that means, you know, when I, I, I spend hours taking really unique pictures, you know, I have, I have a large closet of clothes and I, 
I take pictures and I, I try and get creative and I have a really nice camera and I've invested money into this because from the very beginning, when you take beautiful pictures and you share beautiful content, it gets shared for free. And, and what's more valuable to an entrepreneur than free marketing, you know, like, and so on Instagram, if you take a beautiful picture, it's going to get shared. And, and, and early on our pictures would get picked up by a bigger account. I remember specifically the first time, um, we, we got picked up by this pretty big fashion blogger. He shared one of our photos and I remember I was, I was, I was on a plane and I landed and I got, you know, I had a bunch of new followers and I was like, well, you know, where is this? And I realized how, how proud I was like, and how grateful I was for that share. But I also realized like, man, if I keep taking the pictures that I am and I try and, you know, if I really put my resources and time into this, it's going to get shared for free and we're going to grow. And so that's, that's always been my philosophy. And I, I do take, I take my time and I put resources and money behind it because great pictures on photo sharing services like, you know, platforms like Facebook and Instagram and Pinterest, great pictures get shared organically. And that's, that's huge for, for, you know, for your wallet. I don't have to pay for that. And so the secret for me has always been just taking and producing and generating the best content I can. And not only, you know, not only taking the time, but also putting money and resources into that. That means having a nice camera and nice lenses and giving products away to models sometimes. Um, you know, I'm in most of the pictures, but, but at times I do offer shoes to people if they'll be models. Um, and, and, uh, you know, that's been really important. I, I personally do not believe in, in, um, you know, services like Instagram and, and those kind of, I, I really despise them. Honestly, I think that they're a waste of time and a waste of money because consumers are so smart. They can see through, you know, this, this fake activity on an Instagram account when the same mm -hmm. account is commenting the same comment on every account saying, Whoa, we love this. You know, we love this hard eyes. We love this hard eyes, you know, like, and liking, you know, when, when, when some huge company is liking some, individual's picture that has nothing to do with their product. It, it's, it's like, duh, you know, like people can see through it. And so, you know, with how smart consumers are and with how smart the general population is, I just think, what is the point of having a follower if they're not going to be a buyer, you know? And, and, right. and obviously I have tons of followers that, that will probably never buy a product from me. Um, but early on, it's not about like, don't waste your time getting followers if they're not going to be advocates and buyers. Like they're just dead weight. You know, like the more followers I have that aren't interested in purchasing means the, the more difficult it is for me to find and target and educate my audience who actually does care. You know, it's kind of like white noise getting in the way between me and my customers. Um, so, so for me, it's all about content and not about some secret service that, that, you know, you pay 50 bucks a month and we'll do all this activity and we'll get you followers. It's like, they're not meaningful followers. You know, they're, they're just, they're just fluff, you know, to, to beef up your numbers, but, but who cares if you create great content. And, and of course people would say, Oh, that's easy for you to say you have, you know, 300,000 followers. That's true. But early on I didn't. And it's always, from the beginning, I built a platform and a foundation of, great content and engaging with our audience and not, you know, not artificially being active on Instagram, but actually truly being active on Instagram and putting resources behind it. Yeah. That, that's a great point that having these large followings that are, you know, grown in automated ways or kind of a spammy ways is not, it's harmful. It can be harmful too. It's not just you have these great numbers and they're not going to harm you. But like you're saying, you're you're literally bringing on a bunch of dead weight, a bunch of white noise that now you have to put more effort into sifting through. So you're essentially adding more work. Yeah, especially with the new out, the new Instagram algorithm. When Facebook bought Instagram, we kind of all knew where Instagram was going. And now with the algorithm and and kind of the limited um, display, you know, it's only displaying to about you know, 20 to 30% of your audience now. And so it, you know, it, obviously it's, it's set up to target your most active and most loyal followers, but it still means that, you know, there's probably 200,000 people that will never see 
my product and might never see my advertisements and never see my, you know, my posts because, um, you know, they're that white noise. Whereas if I had a more, you know, more targeted and kind of got rid of, you know, it's just like an email subscriber list. Like let's get rid of the, the subscribers that are inactive, you know, like let's, let's cut them off and get more honed in on who is actually reading these emails. It's the same with Instagram. I wish that if I could, you know, if I could, I would say, Hey, Instagram, anyone that hasn't seen one of our posts in the last month, please remove them from my followers list to make it more lean, more targeted. Um, because you know, it, it's obviously nice for, for brand legitimacy and validity and confidence in the consumer to have a lot of followers, but it just gets in the way of targeting and the ability to target who you really want to be targeting because it's all these people that follow me for my pictures and not for my product necessarily. Mm. Now, when you were creating this content early on, if for anyone out there that doesn't feel particularly creative, what kind of conscious creative decisions or what kind of creative tips do you have to offer when taking these kind of photos that you've had success with on your Instagram? And I, I am not a photographer, neither is my wife. Um, when we started this, we, we knew nothing about taking pictures. But, but early on we were actually, you know, I, I was eventually hired by big shoe companies to take pictures for them. Um, this was before I launched our shoe, before I launched Taft shoe line, but it, you know, you don't have to be a good photographer to take some of the best pictures on Instagram. Um, and that's why, you know, that's why the professional photographers are kind of hurting right now because, you know, with the tools of Instagram and Visco cam and and with how easy it is to shoot great pictures now, you don't have to be a photographer to take, you know, you don't have to be a photographer to, to, to be a photographer on social media. And so some of my tips would be, you know, get a decent camera. You don't need an amazing camera. I have, you know, I shoot on a Canon uh, 5D Mark II, which is a, it's a very expensive camera. Um, but, I've, you know, I've slowly upgraded. I, you know, I, I used to shoot on just an iPhone and then I shot on a Canon Rebel and I've slowly upgraded. Um, but some tips would just be to get, get a decent, um, get a decent camera. I would also say get, um, you know, a lot of people like the look of a 50 millimeter lens. You can get, you know, a 50 millimeter lens 1.8, um, for like a hundred bucks and it will give you that really professional look. Um, you know, some pe people kind of tr struggle to articulate that look that they're going for, but I'm guessing it's a lot of times it is the 50 millimeter look of, you know, that shallow depth of field. And, um, so good, a, a decent camera, um, posting often, you know, post two or three times a day, even if it's difficult, um, repost good pictures from that you've been tagged in that are relevant to your product. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I utilize Visco cam even when I was shooting, you know, I was shooting for big shoe companies and I was editing the photos just on my phone. And, and, uh, you know, it's amazing what we can do with, with, with an iPhone and a couple apps. And so utilize things like Visco cam and Photoshop express apps, um, to be able to edit on your phone and, and turn a mediocre picture into something that's really beautiful online. Mm. Now you mentioned a couple of times that you run the company completely yourself. Can you give us an idea of how large, how successful the business is today? We are certainly on our way to be, um, you know, we're, we're doing millions of dollars of sales, um, with, with tens of thousands of orders. And, and we're growing very quickly and very rapidly. And we're just really starting to advertise, you know, last year we, our, our marketing budget was very, you know, pretty much zero because we were always sold out. But this year we're starting to, you know, I'm starting to really hone in on some, some good ROI channels for us in terms of marketing. And, you know, this year we will do, um, you know, we'll, we'll do, um, many millions of dollars, which is, which is awesome for a company of our size and of, of our age. Um, you know, we're, we're really getting there and it's really exciting. Awesome. So taftclothing.com, T-A-F-T-C-L-O-T-H-I-N-G.com is the website. Where do you want to be this time next year? This time next year, I want to, um, have some employees, <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it's long overdue. Um, but I'm, but I'm really taking my time um, I've, in, I've been recruiting for like six months now, but I'm really taking my time and I'd rather stunt the growth of the business than to, to make a bad hire. So I'm, I'm really taking my time and, and finding the, the right people and the right, you know, the right people to bring on board. Because at this point, 
a bad hire could really negatively affect the culture of the business. And that's what's most important to me. So I'd rather take it slow and, and grow a little more slowly and hire, hire really well than just rush into some quick hires and, and end up regretting it later. So at this point next year, I hope to hire, I hope to, um, I hope to be, to be in, in maybe a couple more categories, not just shoes, but maybe, you know, maybe something else. Um, and I hope to just, I hope to, to keep loving what I do. Uh, right now I, I love what I do, but there's also a lot of things that I don't like about, about tap, you know, things that obviously there's things about every job people don't like. So I hope to, to get some of those things off my plate so that I can focus on what I love to do and what makes me happy and, and what I do well, because for me, tact is working because, because I'm happy doing it. And, and that's really important to me, how I feel about the brand, how I feel about doing this every day for my family. You know, it's, it's, it's obviously really close to my heart and, and I hope to continue developing a deeper love for my customers and a deeper love for my products over the next year. Awesome. Hopefully some ambitious listeners will reach out and, and apply for to work with you. <laughs> Thank you so much again for your time, Corey. Oh, thanks, Felix. I appreciate it. Here's a sneak peek of what's in store for the next Shopify Masters episode. And you can really represent your brand across all facets, from typography to all the imagery. And so I think always do a Shopify store and in tandem with an Etsy store. Thanks for listening to Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. To start your store today, visit shopify.com slash masters to claim your extended 30-day free trial.